Hi, everybody. Welcome to Street Laws Resources for AP Government, SCOTUS Comparison Question Preparation at Home Online Webinar. Um, as you come in, hopefully you had a chance to respond to the poll. We're interested to see what, um, what your schools are doing about um, the current situation. We're going to give people about another minute to join the webinar, and then we're going to jump right in. Um, at the very beginning of the webinar, I'm going to give you directions about how to participate if you want to participate. So um, that's one of the very first things we'll talk about. In the meantime, if you have questions or technical issues, um, you can access the chat function, which may be under a button um, with three dots that say more on your um, dashboard. And we have um, two other people from the office, Jasmine and Ben, who are um, gonna moderate the chat room and help you out with whatever needs um, that you have there. Okay, so today we're going to um, try to do a lot of things in an hour. I thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to talk about what we're gonna do right now. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to me and Street Law. Um, we're gonna just review a little bit about the 15 cases and the Street Law materials that we have available for you on those 15 cases. Um, review the format of FRQ3. Um, and briefly talk about um, what the format of the, the exam this year may be um, and try not to speculate too much on that and just talk about what we do know. Um, we're going to spend most of the time today talking about two case study methods that street law um, has available to help scaffold the skills that are required for uh, not only FRQ3, but also, also multiple choice questions that may present themselves on the exam. Um, we're going to talk about the comparison cases that you might use, since we know that um, a big part of FRQ3 is that the students will be presented with cases that they probably are not familiar with, cases you did probably did not think to expose them to. Um, so we have a list of those cases and then talk in general about um, the way street law has tried to adapt to help teachers with at-home learning. Um, and I'm going to do my best to leave some time for Q&A so that we can get people's questions answered. Um, you may or may not be familiar with street law. That is our website, uh, streetlaw.org. Hopefully after the webinar, you'll have some time to poke around the website if you're not already familiar with it. We have lots of um, materials that are good for government and law and civics. Um, we have many programs um, other than just um, teacher professional development. So hopefully you'll have some time to take a tour there. Um, that is my name and title and uh, email. Uh, just briefly about myself, I just recently retired after 27 years of teaching, 26 of those years AP government, um, and a lot of those years a law elective. Um, I also, for my last year of teaching, I taught all, a one-year online honors government class, and that was um, a really good experience in retrospect to sort of make, to help with this transition for a lot of you. And I also helped to write our online EP government course. Um, I never got to teach it because I retired, um, but I did help write it for um, my county. Uh, as far as experience with College Board, um, I had I would have been a reader for 15 years. I spent a couple years as a table leader at the AP reading, and my last year at the AP reading two years ago, I was a question leader. Um, so. Probably some of you are like, she looks a little familiar. Um, and it may be from uh, Salt Lake City or Daytona Beach or um, even Colorado before then. 
Okay, so these are what our outcomes will be today. Um, we're going to look at FRQ3. Um, we're going to uh, look at these two case study um, methods, which I think that, that there are others that would be useful as well, but I think these two particularly are well suited to scaffold skills for FRQ3. And then give you a little template to help you really quickly create your own FRQ3 um, with perhaps one of our comparison cases. Um, I'm going to turn off my video now um, because it takes a little bandwidth and, and you can see from the background, I'm sure I am at home like most of you. Um, and so I'm going to turn off my video. I'm still here though. Okay, these, this is the way to participate in the webinar. Um, to leave questions about content or methods that I will um, address at the end of the webinar, you should have in your um, little toolbar thing that's usually at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, you will have um, an option for Q&A. Uh, chat, you have to, um, you probably have to go under the more button that has three dots and enable your chat so that you can um, add things to the chat. Um, and the last one, if you have a really urgent question, you want your voice heard, you can raise your hand um, and I should get a little indicator that you have your hand raised and I can, um, I can unmute you so that you can ask that question verbally. And if you have any questions about how do I participate, again, chat is the best way to go because um, we have people moderating the chat throughout. Okay, so for the 15 required cases, um, when AP redesigned a few years ago, I'm sure you all know, we went from having 50 cases maybe that you taught in, in um, class and you were just sort of guessing what cases might be on the exam to College Board telling us that there were 15 required cases um, and putting them in the curriculum so we sort of knew what they were looking for on those 15 cases. This is them. Um, you can see them in that list right there. You're probably super familiar with this list. Um, the Supreme Court Historical Society gave us a very generous grant to help us write case summaries for all 15 of those cases. Um, and that we have had many, many, many downloads and uh, lots of feedback from teachers that they are helpful. I'm going to talk a little more in a moment about how the case summaries are structured. Um, we also developed a list of comparison cases that we have materials for um, that so you can easily plug those into your activities and you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what would be a good comparison case. Um, and then we also have teaching summaries. Uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, you will receive a link, both in email form and it's on my last slide as well, so you can jot it down if you, if you don't have time to wait for the email. It's going to take you to all of the materials I talk about in this webinar, and I will include this PowerPoint, and that's why I've embedded these links. So um, you can just go back into the PowerPoint and click on the links. That link will take you to all 15 of the required cases as one document. I'm gonna warn you it's about a 60 some page document. Um, you can also download the cases um, as Word files so that they're fully editable individually. Um, originally we just had them available individually but um, there was a, a sort of call on the AP government uh, Facebook page that people would be really would really appreciate having them all as one document so they only needed to do the downloading once so we've also made them available as one document. Okay I uh, don't want to spend much if any time speculating about what this exam is going to look like this year. I'm sure you all have been monitoring um, what's coming out of College Board, but we know that on Friday morning they put out an announcement that the exam would be 45 minutes long um, and that the structure of the questions would be announced later. And they also um, put in a chart below that um, for each specific course uh, what units would be covered and they announced that units one through three would be covered for AP GOPO. Um, sometime later in the morning, Trevor Packer uh, tweeted that there would be no multiple choice. Um, 
it'll, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, they've promised on or before April 3rd, there will be an announcement that will be much more specific about what the content of the exam will be. So I think those are the knowns. Everything else is speculation at, that, at this point, but it seems like there's a fairly good chance that FRQ3 um, would be one of those FRQs. I mean, I guess there's at least a 50-50 chance. Um, so if you look at w which units AP assigns the cases, you will see that 14 of the 15 required cases do fall within units one through three. The only case that doesn't is uh, Citizens United v. FEC, which is in Unit 5. Um, this is the second of these webinars. In the first webinar, someone asked the question, isn't uh, Citizens United a First Amendment case? Because it's about speech and campaign, you know, whether or not campaign contributions are speech. I think you can make an excellent argument for that. Um, were I in the classroom, I would make sure my students knew that case so I didn't get caught, but um, I have checked the course and exam description, usually just referred to as the CED, and, um, and College Board does place Citizens United in topic five. I don't know whether that means it will be covered or not. I can just tell you that that's where um, it does not come up in, the, in unit three where the other freedom of speech cases come up. Um, most of the cases fall within Unit 3, which means that these cases are still um, fair game. I know that that's caused some trepidation on the part of teachers because um, many teachers don't teach the units in order and haven't yet taught Unit 3. Um, so hopefully the, the methods and the resources we talk about today will help you uh, fill that gap if you are in that position. Okay, so I, made, I mentioned case summaries several times now. Um, case summaries are our way of writing up all sorts of Supreme Court cases, uh, landmark cases, current cases, and we do it in a very formulaic way. Um, every case summary is set out with, um, with facts, issues, precedents, arguments, and the decision. Many start with background that comes even before the facts. Um, so, for instance, um, in a case that we just wrote out, up about the Louisiana abortion law, um, we had to have a background section that sort of talks about where the right to privacy comes in the Constitution. So where do you even get that? The Roe v. Wade um, summary has that as well. You know, where, does, where are these rights rooted in the Constitution before the facts of the specific case are even mentioned? So many cases also have a background section. Um, but they all at least have these sections. And we like to think of these as sort of ingredients and recipes. So if you have these ingredients, these five ingredients, that you can put them together in different ways to make a different case study activities for your students. Um, there are hundreds of these in our free store. Um, and we, I have the store, the word store in quotation marks because it does look very much like a store when you go to the store. Um, it's gonna ask you to put items in your basket. It's gonna ask you to check out. Um, and when you go to the checkout page, it looks very much like you're gonna be charged. For instance, it asks for your billing address. Um, but I promise you, unless you're ordering some kind of swag or a textbook or the one um, mock trial and moot court guide, um, when you get to payments, it is going to say payment is not required for this order, and you're going to see that your total in U.S. dollars is zero. Um, I just mentioned this because some teachers um, sort of chicken out and back out because it really does look like it's going to ask for payment information. It won't ask for any of that. Um, we go through this process because it helps us know who is using our materials where. Um, we have a lot of um, generous grants that allow us to do this work and not charge you for it, but sometimes those, um, those organizations want to know how often are the materials being used, where are they being used. Um, so that's why we have this process. I apologize, it's a little laborious, um, but promise you that the bottom line will be that you are not charged. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about classifying arguments and applying precedents in more detail, but we do have seven actual case study methods 
that we wrote up in a, I think, pretty useful short um, document called Using Case Studies in the Classroom. When we send you the link, this will be part of the materials, but you can also download it um, at this link from the store. Um, you'll get a lot of materials as part of the um, bit.ly link that you get at the end, but I do urge you to, for some of these things, um, use the store because the, the, inf the documents in the store will be forever fresh when we make additions to them, they will be updated. The documents that I send you obviously are stagnant, and if there are updates to any of those, um, it won't be carried over to the documents that I send you. And the judicial opinion writing is a, a separate method, and I'm going to suggest that as an extension for classifying arguments. So you'll see that one as well. Okay, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time talking about FRQ3 because I'm guessing that a lot of you are pretty familiar with it, have taken um, APSIs or just sort of self-taught knowing that your students are facing them um, in the very near future. But um, there are four different types of, of FRQs, so I thought I'd just start with a, a review so this one's front of mind while we talk about the activities today. Um, I'm going to show you two examples of FRQ3. One is the exam question from last year, the actual exam question that students took and was scored at the reading. Um, and the other one is the one from the, the CED, the course and exam description. Um, I believe at this point all of the others are in um, exams that are secure. So you have access, if, you, if you're um, an active AP teacher, you have access to other examples as well in those secure exams. Um, so last year's question that was on the actual AP exam was a companion case to, or comparison case to Brown v. Board of Education. Um, you can read that little summary if you're not familiar with this question while I talk. But you'll notice that when they give students these, um, these paragraphs, um, summaries of the cases, they tell them everything they need to know about that case. They don't, they don't expect any knowledge of that case outside of what they give you in the question itself. And then the student tasks that they were asked to do, um, and these are pretty formulaic, at least from what we've seen from College Board so far, is that they would uh, ask the students to identify the clause, in this case in the 14th Amendment, that was the basis for both Brown and Hernandez, um, and then explain the facts in how the facts in both Brown and Hernandez led to a similar decision in both cases. Um, so you'll notice that first of all, they didn't expect the students to come up with a comparison case on their own, you know, to look at Hernandez v. Texas and, and know on their own that the comparison case would be Brown. Um, I don't know that we can always assume that will be the case, but right now for all the questions that we've been able to see, um, they're telling the students this is the comparison case. Um, and then you'll notice that the words that I have in green are the things that are going to be really important to answering this question successfully and the things that our two methods are going to help um, emphasize for your students. One is the part of the Constitution that is being interpreted, the clause in this case. One is the facts of the case and the other is the decisions and not just the decisions but but how do they apply to each other? How do you compare those? Um, how do you take the precedent set in Brown and see if it is, um, if Hernandez is analogous to that or distinguished from it? Um, and C is a little bit of a wild card. I'm not gonna talk about C too much today because C seems to be the, the time when um, College Board is, is pulling in another unit um, and asking, taking what they know about the case and asking them to, um, to look at another unit. And in a second, you'll see the Grease Galloway um, example. We do know, I think, that um, whatever comes up in C will be from unit one through three because, um, because they've said that they're restricting the content to units one through three. This was the one that were, uh, the, the very first question that, that College Board published when it introduced the idea of SCOTUS comparison, FRQs. Um, and this one is about Town of Greece v. Galloway. And the comparison case is Angle v. Patel. Um, so once again, they give a little background about the case. They talk about the decision in the case. 
and they give you students everything that they need to know about this case to be successful. So um, you wouldn't be concerned if you didn't teach that case in class, and I think it would be um, not too many teachers would have taught that case. The student tasks are very similar to the other question, and as I said so far, what we've seen that this is very formulaic. The first one is to identify the constitutional clause, again, common to both cases, um, and then based on the constitutional clause, explain why the facts in Engel led to a different holding than the holding in Greece v. Galloway. Um, by the way, from what I've seen in these and the other questions, sometimes they use the word decision, sometimes the word they use the word holding. Um, so probably students should be familiar with both of those terms. And then again, C is a little bit of a wild card. The other question was about interest groups. This question is about the public. Um, there could conceivably be questions about the institutions, um, you know, that C is going to bring in another unit of study. One of the other things during the redesign um, that I think was very welcome for a lot of teachers is the commitment to have a stable rubric for the FRQs. Um, this is us, what the stable rubric for FRQ3 looks like. Um, again, in A, there's going to be an identification point for the clause. In B, there's going to be a point attached to um, discussing relevant facts um, from the required case, so one of the 15. Um, and B is going to be a point for uh, correctly explaining how the facts in both cases led to either a similar or different decision. Um, so again, today we're going to look at activities, um, classifying, the classifying arguments activity is going to be really helpful for um, students to learn the clause involved and the relevant facts and um, of the required case and then the, um, the uh, applying precedence activity is going to be really helpful in that B2 point where they're looking at a similar decision or different decision. Um, quickly, and I made this slide before we knew there wouldn't be multiple choice questions, or before, I shouldn't say before we knew, but before Trevor Packer tweeted that there wouldn't be multiple choice questions, um, that there are multiple choice SCOTUS questions, um, and this is what it says in the CED, individual and set-based multiple choice questions will assess students' ability to apply Supreme Court decisions in authentic contexts. So we know that there are questions that basically ask sort of in a very forthright way, what is the holding of this, of this case? Um, there are application questions where the students are either given a hypothetical case or a comparison case and ask, um, for instance, which case would be used as a precedent in this case. So maybe there's a question about um, a per, a students who want to wear rainbows on their shirts to um, to support the LBGTQ community and their school doesn't want to allow that, which case might they look to as a precedent? Um, those kinds of cases. There are cartoon analysis, qualitative analysis questions that deal with Supreme Court cases. Um, and I think there'll be questions as well about the potential impact of, or not the potential, but the impact of cases. And I'm thinking there are questions about, for instance, Citizens United and the impact would be um, the birth of super PACs. Um, so there will be multiple choice questions that deal with these um, in the future. Okay, let's get to case study one, classifying arguments. Um, in the classifying arguments study, case study method, students are given the facts, background if there is one, facts, issue, and unmarked arguments from a case, and they're asked to analyze which side each argument would help. So I'm going to show you on the next slide an example from McDonald v. Chicago, which of course is one of the required cases. Um, there's a link to it in the store, but you'll get the document as well and your link to this webinar. This isn't the whole document, it's just the first five arguments, but I wanted to keep the font large enough for you to be able to read. Um, for McDonald v. Chicago, we have this one already ready for you in the store. You could use it tomorrow if you want, and I'll talk about the other option um, shortly. But this one's already made for you, and it has the arguments that could be used either on the side of um, McDonald or on the side of Chicago about whether or not Chicago's, you know, in all practical purposes, gun handgun ban 
um, violated the Second Amendment. So students are asked to read the article and apply the constitutional clause or the precedent um, to try to think about, does this argument help? Which side does this argument help? Um, so there's a sort of example from McDonald v. Chicago. So how you would prepare for this, there's two different options. We have a number of these that we've made um, for professional development um, seminars that we've done across the nation where we um, have them all ready to go. The, if you want to use one of those, you would go to the store and search classifying arguments and you'll get a number of them that pop up. Um, there's some about Tinker. There are lots of different um, options for this. If you wanna make your own, it's really relatively simple. I do it all the time for, for PDs and it takes me maybe about 10 minutes um, and it's literally cut and pasting. So we have hundreds of others, uh, uh, hundred of others uh, case summaries and you just download those as Word documents um, from the store. You copy and paste the arguments in a random way and um, take out you know, any indication that might uh, tip the hand. There's usually not much of that. And save it as a separate document. So when you hand it to students, it has the background, the facts, the issue, the precedence, and it has the, the arguments in a random order. Um, you can either post these on your Google Classroom um, or Blackboard or however you communicate with your students. You could email the handout out. Um, you could, um, and you, or you could even um, have it delivered to their home. I know some school districts are doing packet delivery. Um, you can even make it like that. Once they have that, um, they're going to look again, just like we did at that McDonald example, and decide which side each argument helps. Um, they can, you'd, I think you'd have several options there as far as online, at home learning. You could have them copy and paste them into a new doc document where they label, they type in a label, arguments for Chicago, arguments for McDonald, and copy and paste the arguments underneath of it. Um, that's probably the best format to ask them to do if you're going to later have them um, compare it to the, the whole case summary, the sort of right answers. Um, you could also have them print it and label it and either scan or return it in whatever way, snail mail, packet, pickup, uh, however you're going to do that. Um, or you can label the number, the arguments like we have in this one. And in a discussion board, you could have them say, arguments for McDonald are one, three, and five, arguments for Chicago are two, four, and six. Um, I think any of those options would work well um, or email you that information. After students submit their answers, what, however you're gonna have them do that, um, you could either post the full case summary, which has the answers um, in the form I was just talking about. It says arguments for McDonald and it has those arguments bulleted out and then arguments for Chicago with the arguments bulleted out. Um, or you can have them complete the following extension activity, which is essentially the judicial opinion writing activity. And that would be that after they have classified the arguments, to have them decide what their opinion would be if they were playing the role of justice in this case. Um, they would say, I find for McDonald for the following reasons. It would ask them to apply the constitutional clause or provision in this case, Amendment 2. Um, it would ask them to apply the precedents and to highlight the arguments that they found most compelling in the classifying arguments activity to be able to support their decision. Um, and those directions are all laid out in that same document I referenced before using case studies in the classroom under judicial opinion writing. Um, I think there are lots of options for how you might be able to handle this um, online and at home kind of forum. I think a discussion board might work really well to have students um, post their opinion in the discussion board and then encourage students to read other pieces other justices' opinions and either concur or dissent um, with their opinions by replying on their posts. Um, applying precedents. So 
in applying precedents uh, like the FRQ3, probably you're gonna introduce your students to a case that is not one of the other required cases, um, maybe even a current case. So a comparison case that we used last year a lot was Tyson Timms and a 2012 Land Rover v. State of Indiana. Um, this was a really interesting case because it was in a modern incorporation case and there wasn't, there weren't all that many, there aren't that many left, um, any many amendments left. And this one was about whether or not the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment should be incorporated against the states. Um, it dealt with civil forfeiture and in specific this uh, Indiana code about civil forfeiture. Um, in this case, the gentleman you saw in the first slide um, was, um, was arrested and his uh, 2012 Land Rover, which he bought with the money that he received from his father's life insurance, um, was seized. And um, the question was whether or not this was uh, an excessive fine based on his um, charge, um, which was possession of opioids. So in this case, you would, you would find a case like that. And we have, uh, I'll talk about SCOTUS in the classroom um, on one of the next slides. Um, but we have lots of cases, both from recent terms um, that we thought are good comparison cases and high interest to students, um, or you could pick a historic case as well, of course, but um, students, I think, really in, get invested in these cases that are ongoing or very recent. So in this case, for applying precedents, you give your students facts, issues, arguments, and the precedent of the comparison case, um, depending on where you are maybe in the year or your course of study with the comparison case and all talk about that in a moment. Um, the, the idea of this activity is that one of the things that lawyers are tasked to do is take precedents and apply them. Um, we know in general, um, and we know that AP tests the concept of stare decisis, um, following precedent, letting the decision stand, um, but sometimes the court reverses its decisions. So um, that idea of applying precedents from the required cases to these new cases that are novel, that students haven't been, um, haven't been exposed to before, is the same skill that they're asked to do in FRQ3. To make this hopefully easier for you, uh, we created a document called com uh, Comparison Cases. Um, that's the link to it, but you'll also receive it. In this document, it says uh, for all 15 cases, it has the, uh, the issue, the constitutional question in that case, um, and it also has uh, comparison cases. Now, I know that there are maybe for some of these cases better comparison cases out there, um, but we, we've only put on this document cases that we have all the resources for. We have a case summary written for those cases. Um, and so you can see from McCullough v. Maryland, we're suggesting cases like Gonzalez v. Reich, which is about um, marijuana, um, the Sebelius case, which is about the Affordable Care Act, Gibbons, um, so these will take you to cases that you can really easily use as comparison cases. Um, so one of the things that you would do when you, if you decided to use, uh, we have a few of them uh, already made up for you, like this McDonald uh, one, McDonald Tim's one, you'll find that in the store already made for you, um, but we don't have a ton of them. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is they're very easy to do on your own. Um, so you would pick a comparison case, uh, delete the decision and opinions, and then decide how much information you wanted to give your students about the required case. So um, if you, let, we'll use the Tim's McDonald um, example. You could give them the full summary for McDonald. If you hadn't introduced McDonald before, you hadn't spent a lot of time studying it, maybe it's very early in the year, you're just doing the Bill of Rights, um, you might want to give them the full summary. It will give them all of that same information about McDonald. Um, if, it's the, if you've maybe taught McDonald but didn't spend a lot of time on it, you feel your students need a quick review, within the Tim's summary, there will be a paragraph about McDonald that says essentially what the holding in McDonald was. 
and why it's sort of applicable to Tim's. If you really taught your students McDonald or it's towards the end of the year and you really want to see if they know it well enough to perform well on the FRQ3, maybe you give them nothing about McDonald. Maybe when you give them the, um, the information for applying precedence, you even delete the, the paragraph about McDonald because at this point they should have that information um, mem I hate to use the word memorized, but internalized. So um, they, you don't have to supply them with it. Um, and then you can just cut and paste the names into this template. So um, this is an example for Tim's. Um, it tells the students that they've been provided with information about the two cases, that they've been given um, the information from the comparison case, and if maybe you're going to give them information about McDonald, unless you expect them to already know that. And it's going to ask them to decide whether or not Tim's is analogous or similar to the precedent case um, and how they are distinguished or different from each other. Um, you don't have to use the words analogous and distinguished if you don't want to. I haven't seen them in AP, uh, in college board language, um, not to say that it wouldn't be in the future, but I have never seen it. Um, I used it with my students because the court uses it, and if nothing else, it's good SAT prep. Um, but these things are all downloadable as Word documents, so if you didn't want to use those terms, you could easily um, delete them. So there's basically a template that you can use um, to make your own for whichever two cases that you'd like to. Um, and that's to pick a comparison case and pick a required case and just uh, insert the names as they appear. So these are the tasks that the students are asked to do, to show how the comparison case is analogous or similar to the precedent case by pointing out factual and legal similarities. So you can remember back to FRQ3 and what they were asked to do in FRQ3, look at the, how the facts are different or similar. So that's gonna help them scaffold for that. The same, question two is the same, but it's gonna ask them to look from the other side. Um, precedent cases are sort of like statistics. They usually can be used to help both sides as if you apply them differently. So it's asking them the, to do the opposite so that every student would be asked to do both. Um, and then based on, um, based on everything, do they, would they decide for McDonald's or would they decide for um, Chicago? And then overall, would they find the um, precedent analogous or distinguished? Um, so would you find that McDonald is analogous or distinguished case to um, Tim's? So how you would do this online, um, I think you would go ahead and make the applying precedence activity just like you would in if you were gonna hand it out in your classroom. Um, you could either post it in Google Classroom or Blackboard or whatever, um, whatever platform that you're using. You could email the applying precedence to your students. If you're having packet delivery, you could have packet delivery. Um, the students would answer the questions probably on their own. Um, we usually encourage that this work is done in groups. If you have the ability in your, on your platform to send students to breakout rooms, I think it would be a great idea to have um, you know, a number of breakout rooms, send them out there to do that sort of heavy lifting of reading and discussing and deciding how to apply the precedent. Um, and then uh, if you have the ability to have a synchronous class discussion, uh, you could certainly at the end have a synchronous class discussion about their findings, whether they found them to be, um, to be analogous or distinguished. You could certainly do a discussion board entry where students would have to either pick how is it similar or how is it different or both have to, have to put their two cents in on both sides. Um, or of course you could have them do it in writing um, individually. The other thing that you could do is to make your own sample FRQ question and see how much they learned about applying the precedent by giving them um, uh, an FRQ. And the FRQ they could respond to either in whatever online format you have or in writing. So creating your own FRQ sort of starts the same way as applying precedent with the comparison cases. 
And then we know that the student tasks have been at least pretty formulaic. Um, so that you would give them the back, the background um, facts and um, uh, background facts issue and precedence from your comparison case. And then you would ask them these questions, identify the constitutional clause that is common to both cases. Um, you could, you might have to adjust the word constitutional clause. It might be an amendment. Um, it might be, you know, something else. I'm not sure uh, there are too many options there. Um, and then based on your, what you identified in A, explain why the facts led to a different or similar holding. And you, of course, would be able to choose knowing which your comparison case was at that point, if it was a similar holding or a different holding. Um, and then C, again, is sort of a wild card. So if you were really just trying to assess whether or not they learned the comparison part, you could leave C off um, or you could bring in something from another unit. Generally, they have to um, they have to look and see. You know, you have to look and see what the case is about to decide what makes sense for C. Again, there's a stable rubric, so it would be easy to assess that information. I'm going to talk briefly about street law um, materials. This would be a good time if you have questions to put them in the Q and A because I am going to try to leave 15 minutes for Q and A. So um, I will look at those um, as soon as I get through this part. Um, also at the very end, we're going to ask you how we can help you. We are really interested in trying to support teachers in whatever situation they're in. Um, we'll, we will at that point also show you the results in case you're curious about what um, everyone is doing in their respective schools. Um, but we, we do want to know what we can do to help you and you are able, you're either welcome to put that in the chat, um, which we will archive and look at later, or you, um, I, I, my email will be at the end again, and you're welcome to email me with that information about what we can do to support you. Okay, one of the things that we've done right away is to create um, a materials for at-home learning. So online at-home learning is really not street laws bread and butter we are very much um, we usually do in-person face-to-face teacher pd across the country we encourage teachers to have very student-centered um, interactive simulation type um, educational experiences so this is very new to us but we're trying to uh, you know help you as best we can with the quick transition you've been asked to make. And I know it's a difficult transition. Um, so we put together a web page um, that is that link will take you to. But also um, when you go to our streetlaw.org uh, web uh, regular um, site right now, the landing page will show you a, a banner that has like four or five things on it. And one of the things that will scroll across the banner is this page and you can just click there. So you don't even really need to remember that, um, that address at all. Um, under resources, we have linked um, a bunch of things that might be helpful for both AP, but also law teachers and regular government teachers and even history teachers. We have some middle school. Um, so I've been trying to sort of ignore the chat and not get too distracted by it, but I did see someone ask about reading levels a little bit ago. Um, there are some middle school resources there, which might be good for scaffolding reading um, for your students. Um, this is an evolving page. We are adding to it. One of the things on my to-do list this afternoon is to add several things to, to this um, at-home learning page. So uh, please check it out, but please also check back on it every once in a while because we will um, add things as teachers tell us they um, have a desire for them. One of the other things that we have on our webpage always, not just now, is um, a webpage called SCOTUS in the Classroom. This uh, webpage, we, will, we have cases that are currently before the court, um, and students really find these engaging to be able to decide right alongside the Supreme Court. They also can't um, cheat, I'm doing little air quotes, which you can't see, um, because there is no amp, there is no decision yet in this case. Um, this year, the cases we decided to, um, to highlight in this way um, are Bostock 
v. Clayton County and Altitude Express v. Zarda. These are employment discrimination cases based on sexual orientation. And uh, RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes v. EEOC and Amy Simmons. And that is, that is a employment discrimination based on transgender status case. Um, I was super fortunate to be in the courtroom the, that day. And these are some pictures that I snapped. Um, on the right, Amy Stevens is the woman seated in the wheelchair, and Gerald Bostock is the gentleman with his arms crossed in front of himself in the suit. Um, these cases are written up in case summary form, like we've talk been talking about. They um, are written, all of our case summaries are written at an approximately 10th grade reading level. Um, they are reviewed by um, legal experts, oftentimes people who are very co close to the case, sometimes people who are, are arguing or writing briefs on the cases. Um, and so these cases are, are legally accurate, um, student accessible. We don't presume any legal knowledge. So if we use a term that uh, is not in the common vernacular of a high school student, we define it um, within the text. Us. The other cases we've written up this year are New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. City of New York. This is an excellent comparison case to McDonald v. Chicago. Um, someone in the last seminar asked me to make a um, applying precedence activity with this case, and I will be doing that shortly. Um, and so it's not up in the store yet, but, um, but hopefully it will be up in the store soon. If you're dying for this, um, you can email me and I will send you a copy that maybe is not completely um, street law stamped and approved, but something you could use in your classroom right away. The other case that we um, are following is the June Medical Services v. Russo case, the Louisiana case, um, abortion law case. Uh, also on deck is the faithless elector cases. So um, Chiafalo v. Um, Wisconsin and the, the Baca case. Those cases are consolidated and they're about um, faithless electors being punished for um, not voting the way their state did. Also in your little bit.ly, you're gonna get a copy of this document. It tells you about all sorts of other resources we have for teachers, some of which are maybe not as applicable now that with the reality of um, distance learning, but hopefully in the future you'll find helpful. Um, one of the really good ways to keep up with us is to follow us up on social media. So some of you probably saw this webinar on social media, um, but we have a, a presence on Facebook and Twitter. Um, another good way is to sign up for our educator um, e-newsletter and on the landing page of our website, if you scroll to the very bottom, there's just this little green band um, where you put your name and, e and, um, and email. And make sure that you, um, that you choose Educator eNews. I think it's actually the default, um, but we do have newsletters that are specifically for our volunteers, for legal professionals. So to be able to get the things that you're interested in, which cases we're putting out there, you know, teacher PD opportunities and things, make sure that you choose Educator uh, eNews. Probably a lot of you heard about this webinar because you're already, um, you've, you've already signed up, but we did put out a special edition, um, you know, one about at-home learning opportunities, so. Okay, so I'm uh, gonna go on to Q&A. As a refresher, um, I might be able to look at the, um, Oh, I can answer the question that's just there. So the New York case and the Louisiana abortion cases are, they are in the store. There is not, they are, are there, yes, they're in the store and they're also on the SCOTUS in the classroom page. So if you go to SCOTUS in the classroom, um, it will, you'll um, click on a link that takes you to the store. So those cases are in the store. The only one that is not in the store yet is the faithless elector one, so. So again, so you can write questions in q and I'm going to look at those now. You can put questions in chat. You can also raise your hand at this point if you want to ask a verbal question. Um, one of the things we do want to hear from you, so you can start putting this in the chat if you want to, is we do want to know what we can do for you. Um, you will get the link to these materials, uh, everything that I mentioned. Um, my, that's my email. and um, and. I'll thank you in person in a moment, but uh, we do want to thank you for coming today. So let me come back to this uh, and leave this up as the screen.
And I'm going to go to Q&A. It looks like there are a couple questions. Oh, um, I, so I'm going to read the questions. I don't, I, I think I'm screen, uh, sharing my screen, so I think you can see, but um, just in case you can't, the question was, do you think they will drop Citizens United based on where it falls in the unit? Um, I'd hate to uh, speculate on that. Um, if they're true to what they said about which, uh, it's, it's unit five, topic 11. Um, if they, if they exclude everything from there, they won't, but it is, I, I think the person uh, on Friday made a, an excellent argument that it's a free speech case. Um, I, I would teach it if it were me. Um, that's my uns unsolicited advice, but um, I really don't want to speculate on that. Um, someone, the next question was, you showed that you taught online, oops, it just went away. question jumped. I apologize. I think it's more. Uh, online AP, uh, online GoPo course and helped to plan a course. Could you share more about what resources you use in your approach to designing the course? Um, yeah, so I, one of the things that we did a lot of was um, podcasts. There are a lot of great podcasts out there and um, a really good assignment was to listen to a podcast and we had, you know, questions around podcasts. I think students are really receptive to that. Um, also, the, um, the oral arguments for all modern cases are available in, um, from OEA, and so um, to be able to excerpt or just assign students to listen to oral arguments, um, you know, you have to pick your cases carefully, um, but there are some cases out there. For instance, the Tim's case um, that I used as an example today was a really interesting oral argument, really accessible to students, um, talked a lot about the precedents that we had talked about. They talked a lot about McDonald. So to give them, um, it really helps them to see that this isn't just sort of a, a, a weird activity that you made up that doesn't have any relevance in real life to hear the justices ask the attorneys questions about, you know, but in McDonald, we decided that, you know, the second amendment was, fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty is the, is the, um, the fine, excessive fines clause as fundamental as the Second Amendment, you know, then students were super excited about that. Um, the next question was, will we be able to use some of this presentation for our own kids? Um, you're welcome. I'm sending you the PowerPoint and you're welcome to do with it um, what, whatever you would like. Um, since Unit 5 isn't being assessed, do you think they'll likely be asked um, to connect SCOTUS FRQ to Part C um, to Congress or the President? Um, it is interesting, so I did think about that on my own, and again, this is just speculation, but most of the samples that we've seen, and if you've seen the secure exams, you know this as well, do link them to Unit 5. Um, and if they really are, if, if they do a SCOTUS FRQ or a SCOTUS comparison case, um, I would think that they'd have to rethink um, linking it to interest groups, um, other linkage institutions, the, the public, public opinion, and things like that. Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know that I really have a, an, an answer to, but I've certainly been thinking about it a lot. Um, the, next, uh, the next question is about labeling different parts of their answers on an FRQ. There is much heated debate about this. Um, I don't have an official answer to that. Lots of people go back and forth. Um, I would say from my own experience as a reader, I appreciated it when they were labeled. Um, that's, I can't say. There is no, I, I, apparently in some other subject areas, there actually is a directive about whether they should be um, labeled or not, but in AP GOPO, there, there isn't. It's really, um, yeah, and, and different readers will tell you different things. I'm sure you, you know that. I preferred them labeled. Um, is there a preferred way to scaffold the case summary process for non-AP students? Um, so I think that, um, that on-level students could handle the applying precedence activity, but it, it is getting pretty, um, 
pretty higher order. We do have some activities that might be more well suited to, a, to an on level course. So we have an activity called anatomy of the case. Um, and it's a good way, especially at the beginning of the year to introduce students to the fact that, um, or to the idea that there are, you know, different arguments for different sides and that there are precedents and it, and it asks them to, um, to look at that, to uh, label the summaries. Um, is there much PD for middle school teachers? Um, we do have um, some materials right now for middle school teachers. Um, they are still in, um, a lot of that is still in pilot form. So I think you can look to see a lot more. Um, I have a hand raised, so I'm gonna try to answer that really quickly, although it must be under my... Um, so Ben uh, Marks, I'm not seeing the raised hand on my screen. So if you could help me with that, that would be great. Uh, it should be up at the top by attendees. If you uh, see a little hand raised, looks like Chad Taylor has his hand raised. Um, Hello. Can you uh, can you just unmute him, Ben? There we go. Really there we go. Are you there? Uh, yeah, I am. So I'm a new teacher to the course. Um, I'm getting brand new students for a nine week class. I've never seen them before, never talked to them. It is an own level elective non AP class, and I'm struggling to figure out what to do. So what is the most important lesson that they need to learn in an eight week projected all online, never to see course? And, and what is the course? What's the name of the? Straight law is the name of the course. Oh, so it's a law course. It's straight law, yes ma'am. Okay, so um, if you email me, I will send you a PowerPoint that I just sent to, or that I just presented yesterday in a webinar form to Chicago Public School law teachers. And I think that'll be really helpful for you. Um, you. So we only have three minutes left, so I wanna try to keep it to AP government, um, but I'm happy to send that to you. I think it might be really helpful. It has the same kind of links, but more particular to law, um, to law courses. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I maybe skipped a question here. Oh, mock trials and moot courts. Um, yeah, so uh, again, for the for Jacqueline, the person who asked about the mock trials and moot courts, um, I did have some, just, some suggestions in that very same PowerPoint. So if you want to email me too um, for mock trials, as far as having students, we have some free uh, mock trial um, materials and having students read the materials and write opening statements for one side or another to develop questions and post them um, for witnesses and post them in discussion boards and then have students be able to object um, if they find the questions aren't properly worded and things like that. So I think that might be helpful. Um, oh, so, uh, so, Someone's asking about different reading levels. Um, we do have, and I know this is very limited, um, but hopefully we'll have more in the future. We do have one classifying arguments activity for Tinker written specifically at a middle school level. So those might be uh, really helpful too. Um, as far as moot courts, um, I think it might be pretty challenging unless you have synchronous classes. If you have synchronous classes and particularly the ability, lots of people are asking questions about moot courts. Um, I think it might be, um, if you have synchronous classes uh, the, and the ability to send them to breakout rooms to help prepare the justices to one room, the petitioners to one room, the respondents to another room, and then the ability to present those things, um, I think it might still be, um, be a viable option. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm happy to answer questions. If you're, I know there are more questions in the queue. Um, if your question didn't get answered, please feel free to email me. I am happy to um, answer those. Um, so our moderators have put the poll results up. 
Um, and you can see that uh, there's almost an even break between um, teaching online and, and getting ready to start teaching online. It's interesting the shift from just Friday. On Friday, there was an even break, but also an even break for the fact that the schools haven't decided. And now that's down uh, almost by half. So it looks like, um, if nothing else, schools are, are making decisions about what they're going to do. Okay, I'm turning my camera back on because I wanted to give a sincere thank you um, for all of you who came for taking time out of what is, I'm sure, um, a really hectic time trying to quickly shift gears to online teaching. Um, I really admire you at making this uh, making this transition mid-year. As I mentioned, I taught one year of online and I, I know it took me a couple months to feel like I was sort of comfortable. Um, it's a big shift uh, for people who think that it's, it's a, an easy transition for those of us who are used to having, um, you know, person-to-person -person, uh, in class, uh, in face-to-face -face classes. Um, I know it's not, and we are here to support you however we can, so please feel free to use my email and reach out um, and tell us what we can do to be helpful. So thank you very much for attending. Stay safe. <laughs>